So we wanted to talk a little bit about the degrees uh, of the Blue Lodge in particular, a little bit of an overview of those. Um, you know, Bo and I were talking and, and he kind of mentioned that the last time that I was on talking about sort of the middle way or the, the Masonic pavement. And I had mentioned something about um, that the degrees is what makes our fraternity very different from other fraternities or other clubs that you can join out there. And maybe that we should emphasize that and talk about it a little bit. So there's lots of different clubs that you can join and um, many of them are good service organizations or maybe they're even ones that go along with your profession or professional associations. But Freemasonry is a bit different. It's, uh, yes, we are a fraternity, um, but we also have ritual that we call degree work uh, that is incorporated into the fraternity to help bring about change within ourselves as men and within society in uh, general. Now, glad to make this a conversation and so please feel free to chime in with anything that, uh, any, any questions or comments that you have, and I'll try to stop along the way. So first, um, maybe we should start out with some definitions, and we talked about this a little bit last time. The Grand Lodge of Ohio, they have a great website because they got the corner on freemasonry.com. Uh, so they bought that domain so that a long time ago. So they have some explanations of what Freemasonry is which of course is this really big fraternity, um, officially started in 1717 in England, as you can see on your page. And we unite good men of good character together from different religious, ethnic, political, different walks of life under this idea of a belief in a, a higher power, uh, whether that's a, a religious um, order you belong to, or if you just believe in a higher pow power in general, some sort of concept of God everyone believes in. And that's one of the reasons why I joined Freemasonry myself is when I was living in Philadelphia as a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, I had always been interested in Freemasonry. Um, I had actually encountered Freemasonry as a Mormon missionary in 2000 and well, the year 2000, actually, in Brazil. Um, I had never, I was, I'm from Phoenix. I had never met any Masons that I knew of. And uh, I went on a Mormon mission to Brazil. And the next thing you know, I was meeting all these prominent guys uh, in the northeast of Brazil, in Salvador, Brazil. And I started noticing that they all had this square and compass symbol on their walls or awards from Masonic lodges. And so I started learning about that. And then when I came back to the States uh, a bit later, began to explore Freemasonry and then joined in Philadelphia. Um, and in Philadelphia, I got to meet lots of different types of people that I wouldn't necessarily just run into in my day-to-day -day life or my normal circles or my workplace. Particularly um, got to meet people of different faith traditions that really enhanced my life and helped me to examine my own faith tradition in new ways and help me to um, really form some good friendships. But it's not just about bringing people together, it's also about how we can transform ourselves through this system of Freemasonry. Now, of course, we're called Freemasons because we are a fraternity based off of this idea of the ancient guilds or the medieval guild system. And so we call ourselves Masons because they were literally operative Masons back in the day in a guild that were building cathedrals and temples and things like that. And so that's kind of where our ideas come from. And it is a blueprint. Uh, Freemasonry can be a blueprint for um, living your life. I think the last time Brother Vic mentioned that one of the big advantages of Freemasonry is that it's spiritual but not religious. It has morality, but it's not dogmatic. So no one's going to force you to live a certain way or another, but we have certain standards that are um, pretty common across uh, most religious traditions, but it's not religious in, it, in and of itself. So it's a, it's a fraternity that is international in nature. It's large. Yes, we do do um, charitable works and those kinds of things. But we also have a common belief in a supreme being. 
We also have a common belief in some general uh, laws of morality, if you want to put it that way. And we have a, a sort of a sense of spirituality to, to, to look for making ourselves better. You know, the motto of Freemasonry sometimes is said to, it's to make good men better. And that's a, a good way to think about it. But I think that what we're really talking about is learning how to transform ourselves into better versions of ourselves um, through the application of symbolic ritual that we call degrees. Now, like I mentioned, there's all kinds of different people in Freemasonry and is international. Here's an example here of lots of different brothers um, from all different countries. I think the ones in the middle are from uh, Cuba and there's some from Africa and some from LA and some that ride motorcycles and some that don't, right? So there's all different kinds of brothers that are in this fraternity. And yes, there is even a few famous ones, which we like to point out all the time. And here's a uh, brother Shaq. He likes to prominently display his Masonic ring. And there you can see our, our logo or general symbol of the square and compass uh, that he is displaying proudly. But we do have these ceremonies or degrees. Now they're really rituals and there's lots and lots of rituals inside the sort of family of Freemasonry, if you will. But there's three main degrees that everyone enters through. And those are the ritual of entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason. And I thought we would talk a little bit about these today, um, not in detail because there are some things that we promise to keep confidential, uh, but there are a lot of other things that we, we can and can be um, enlightening for us all to talk about and make sense of. So I think sometimes um, us internally as Freemasons, we don't think enough about what did these degrees mean or what they're trying to teach us. Um, sometimes we get overly caught up in worrying about making sure we recite the words correctly inside of a particular ceremony, which is really good. But at the same time, we need to understand maybe what are these things trying to teach us and how are they supposed to change us. Now, let me stop there and open up for a few questions from any of the people who are not Freemasons that might have the questions that would inform the rest of our discussion before we get too far. And just unmute yourself is okay, I think. Yeah, and I'm gonna unmute them first so they can talk if they want. So go ahead, brothers. Uh... Walt, you're unmuted if you wanna ask a question. I'm good for right now. Okay. So let's let's continue then on talking about the three degrees, how they're kind of laid out, what patterns of learning are there. I'm an educator by trade, so I think of these. Um, I I really kind of look through the educator lens oftentimes, and why these might be important ceremonies for us to think about and how they might affect us. Of course, the first thing is that these rituals, these degree ceremonies happen inside of a Masonic lodge or a Masonic hall or sometimes a Masonic temple, depending on what the building is. And um, the one that I went through in Philadelphia looks very much like this. It's a, a kind of a nondescript blue door that I entered. And the setting is important. Um, context is important and the setting is important. There is a certain degree of awe that's created by entering into a building that is different from the outside world, right? And this is the, a picture of a lodge room. This is actually one that they found inside of a hotel hidden in London. Um, it's very beautiful. It's very majestic. And this is where the rituals of the degree work take place. There's usually an altar in the middle. They have it moved away now, I guess, just to take this picture. But the setting is important. And let me just open this up to some of the brothers. Why, why do you all think that the setting is important? Why is it important to have um, degree work inside of these lodges? I know it didn't start originally in 1717. It was done in pubs and things like that. But why do you think that we put a lot of emphasis now on sort of lodge rooms or 
temple buildings and those kinds of things. Why is it important as Masons? Um, ask your question, brothers. You're all unmuted. I, I'd take a stab at it. Please. Um, I think I think uh, a, a large part of it probably has to do as designing architecture, like architecture, um, uh, certain pieces of art as a as a as a training tool, as educational component, and um, perhaps the setting, the seating sitting setting kind of uh, physically displays like I, I don't know if you want to call it wisdom but utilizing the different degrees perhaps the the stature of the person and and um, kind of breaking down the experience and seniority portions of it maybe so so like we're visually displaying things we're going to learn right inside the lodge room we're also placed in the lodge room so there's a sense of place happening there's a sense of visual experience and sensory experience and i think someone raised their hand go ahead so if i if i can take I, I, my understanding if if i understand it correctly is um didn't the lodges also kind of come about during the times where where masons throughout history and in, in different times of history we're kind of forced underground. So that's kind of what birthed the notion of a lodge room. It was, it was a, it was a, a, a centralized meeting spot. And then from there it just kind of grew into what we now know with the architecture and the, and the, and the artistry and all that fun stuff. Yeah. So if we're thinking about like operative stonemasons back in the medieval days who were making, you know, they're part of a guild or a trade association and they're building buildings, there was a, a lodge, an actual wooden building that they would put next to a cathedral and that's where they would go and and sort of you know like when you think of Econo Lodge right this idea that you would sleep somewhere and have a place to be because you might be a traveling stone mason that is moving from town to town hence the the title free mason you're free to move about which wasn't common in the middle ages but it's also like a symbolic representation of us being free thinking individuals inside of a society of men that are embracing enlightenment ideals. So if you think about this notion of Freemasonry being officially formed in 1717, uh, we know that the old charges go back at least to the 1400s and that much of the sort of philosophical um, trimmings of Freemasonry is a rehash of neoclassicism, Renaissance thought into sort of enlightenment thought. So it's not only that like there was a real place called a lodge where, where these operative masons met, but also is there a place where we can go and meet together to your point um, to learn new things that might not be so accepted by society? Um, there was an interesting uh, book called The Dark Side of the Enlightenment. I encourage you to check it out. And it's talking about wh why during the Enlightenment, you know, during the late 1600s and 1700s, were secret societies uh, flourishing when um, the public interest had shifted towards sort of rationality, enlightenment ideals, the scientific method. And one of their, one of the author's sort of conclusions was that because um, there was so much bloodshed amongst uh, warring factions of religious communities during the medieval times that um, there was certainly a, a sort of distancing from religious tradition. And then through Protestantism, some of the ritual that was found in Catholicism was sort of subverted or taken away um, for various theological reasons. And then so you find sort of the human sort of psyche wanting to find a place to put sort of the spiritual esoteric philosophies into practice and that became the Masonic Lodge, right? It became the place where maybe you didn't talk about some of the things um, that weren't so popular in your church or in your community, but you might be able to go and talk about some of these philosophies that we, we kind of think of as sort of uh, mundane or everyday, but weren't during the late 1600s and the 1700s. This idea of many religious uh, men being able to meet together, being able to cooperate, uh, different political backgrounds coming together to come under a common cause like that just wasn't done 
And then this notion also of a democratic society, so a microcosm of a democratic society where, yes, there is a hierarchy of worshipful master who is sort of the head officer of a Masonic lodge, and there's officers uh, below that, but um, we vote those officers into, into office. And um, there's a, a great scholar at UCLA of Freemasonry who kind of shows that, you know what, um, Freemasonry was the model and template of democratic sort of society and somewhat of, of, uh, of some of the laws and regulations that we now abide by in the Western world, at least. Um, and so it's an interesting place to practice things where it's not high stakes during that time. Other comments? Uh, how you doing, worshipful Brother Cross? Hey, Matthew. Um, to the original question, why the lodge? Um, to me, it's um, all cultures, even our so-called secret society has to have a place to meet. And so that symbol of, of, of union, that, that symbol, that, that, that inner place where we're, where we're all, you know, equal, the lack of judgment, the, the place where you receive the validation from like-minded brothers. Um, that, that is where I see the, the significance of the temple uh, is it gives us that space, right? That safe space, so to speak. Uh, to be able to to think freely, uh, to feel protected, um, to be able to know that I can express myself without judgment amongst my brethren, and should I need, be able to learn from my brethren. So it gives us that that place, that schoolhouse of of thought, uh, yeah. and, and that physical symbol. It's a physical symbol, and we as Masons uh, operate with symbols. Um, yeah. and then you. I, also, I feel I could take it another layer to say that the temple is also symbolic of you as a man. And yeah. uh, you would have to get more into the enlightenment teachings of Freemasonry. And I know we can't do that here, Dr. Cross, but uh, Brother Cross. So, but that's what it means to me. And, and I'm loving it. And Thank from, you. from a servant leadership perspective, it's, 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 um, it's an awesome analogous what you're talking about. So, um, Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I mean, if you think about it, place matters, right? And that's one thing that, you know, look, I'm in online education. I believe in digital education, obviously. I'm here tonight. I think this is amazing. But there's also um, a need for a sense of place, right? Uh, where we can meet together and where we can, uh, I think someone was bringing up earlier that we conduct these rituals of the degrees inside of a lodge room in a physical space that's been set up in a particular way to teach us, but also to engage all of our senses, right? To engage all of us in the learning experience. It's not just sitting down and reading a book and which you can read the ritual in a book, but it's a lot different to um, see it, right? Or to participate in it as a participatory uh, experience. Right. So last time we mentioned that Freemasonry has this definition of being a system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. So it is systematic in that we go through these degrees to learn different lessons, to commit to or to take oaths to live a higher degree of morality in our lives, and then to apply um, symbols to our psyche or to our personal morality to become better people. And one of the reasons perhaps that we use symbols is because um, I believe, for instance, that the psychology of man is such that our primitive brain thinks in pictures and, and it receives symbols and there's lots of meanings you can attach to that. There is no one interpretation to our ritual because we use symbols that can be interpreta interpreted many different ways, but they seem to resonate uh, with us because um, there's something primordial in humans where we want to be able to, or where we can make meaning out of seeing symbols or of applying symbols to ourselves. And also, you know, in the operative days or back in the, in the medieval times when there were actually a guild system operating, it was a good way to teach people who maybe didn't read or write. Um, you didn't say, here's a book and read it and study it and come back. It was participate in this morality play, if you will, this ritual, these degree works, 
and see what you learn through participating and through watching and through listening, right? But of course, our, our allegory is uh, based on the building of King Solomon's temple, the biblical temple uh, found in the Old Testament. And so the allegory or the story that goes along with the ritual is about building this temple, which may be also a symbol for building yourself at the temple, right? Uh, building society, those kinds of things. There's all these different layers of meaning and, 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 um, and really connection that you can find. But the story, the narrative inside of those three degrees is about building Solomon's temple and the chief architect of that temple, whose name is Hiram Abiff, who's found in uh, Second Kings, I believe, right? So you can see that we've expanded upon the biblical tale um, but what we're using it for is for teaching us lessons of morality and spirituality. Comments there. Go ahead. So let's talk then and interrupt me if you have something to say. Let's talk about the first degree entered apprentice. And I kind of broke down and I'm only giving generalities here. So we're, we can't discuss a lot of particulars, but there's a lot more we can describe. And if we described every degree in detail, we wouldn't have enough time, but there's a lot of brothers here who can help correct me and help, help us explain some of these things. But in the first degree, you know, some of the themes of the narrative or the story is about receiving light having a belief in a supreme being, um, the temple of King Solomon and its building, okay, the start of that. So that's kind of what the first degree, the basic story is about. There is a pattern of learning in the degree system uh, where we do take oaths or we make promises not to reveal certain things in Freemasonry, but also to live uh, certain moral laws. And these are nothing earth shattering. It's like, you know, things like you will be honest, uh, you will be, uh, um, you won't, you know, uh, try to commit adultery with your um, brother's wife or something like that, that you will not steal, right? These are basic sort of, uh, if I will say, um, mor mor moral lessons that cut across and moral laws that cut across many religious traditions and spiritual traditions. But we're making these oaths and if you think about the degrees, the way that they're structured is that um, you really don't receive a lot of secret or uh, confidential information until you take the oath, right? Until you promise that you're going to live a certain way and that you are going to um, keep certain things confidential. And then after that, you, are lear you learn a bunch of things, right? You learn um, about different signs that Masons might use, different handshakes that Masons might use and different names of handshakes and those kinds of things, but they are meant to teach you lessons, not just meant to um, have a secret, right? It's meant to teach you lessons, those things. But there is this pattern of oath taking, there's basically an introductory part of every degree, right? That sets the setting, you're in the lodge room, you are dressed in a certain way, you are guided around a lodge room, you make an oath, and then you are, and then you are invested or given certain And after these, when you're given some of this information, there is a portion of each degree that talks about um, what they call the working or operative tools of, of each degree. So the working tools of the entered apprentice degree are the 24 inch, 24 inch gauge or ruler. So like a 24 inch ruler, a common gavel, so like a hammer, I'll show that in a second, and an apron. And if you think about this, uh, if you think of first degree, second degree, and third degree as building upon each other, the first working tools are really basic operative tools. You can um, do some basic building with a ruler and a hammer, a stone hammer, right? But you can't do anything very complex. <laughs> and you're probably not the one who's planning the work you're probably not the boss. You're probably the worker bee, like the inter-apprentice is, someone who is going to um, 
put into action the plans of someone else, right? So I uh, found a bunch of images that are royalty free from monet, uh, Masonic ritual monitors that we can have here. So you see the common gavel, the 24 inch gauge, and we, have, we apply those to our lives uh, in symbolic ways. So just one example is the 24 inch gauge in Freemasonry, it, we are told that it is to help us divide out our time, that there's eight, eight hours for uh, our vocation, eight hours for rest, and eight hours to our devotion to God and to our, basically our community, right? Or to our fraternity. And so this idea of balancing our time and managing our time is taught through this symbol of a ruler that an operative or an actual stonemason would just use um, to build buildings, right? But we're saying, how do we apply this symbolically to ourselves and similarly with this, um, with this stone mason's hammer, like can we knock off rough edges of ourself, right? Can we, uh, just like we would to a stone to make it into a better fit for a building, can we do the same thing um, in our lives symbolically? And then at a certain point in the Entered Apprentice is where um, masons are invested with an apron, which many of you have and some of you who are investigating the fraternity will have seen as a public sort of badge of freemasonry it's a, a white lambskin apron that we are told symbolizes innocence and it is um is something that is used throughout the degree work in various different ways but you're invested with this piece of clothing so not only are you given information you're given these symbolic tools to use you're also physically given a piece of clothing and you've also maybe been given some of these handshakes that we've talked about at the beginning. And so you're receiving different uh, tactile pieces of information to apply symbolically to your life. Let me stop there. Any, any questions or comments? Corrections even. Yeah, I, I hate to bring this back up, but I was trying to remember what was that book that you mentioned to us uh, just a little while ago? Oh, The Dark Side of the Enlightenment. Thank you. That's all I needed. Yep. Hey, Ted, hold on one second, Ted. Okay. I, I had to let everybody unmute themselves. So go ahead, brothers. If you want to ask a question, you can unmute yourself now. Brother Ted. Yes. Vic. Hey, Vic. You look well. Same to you. Uh, the 24 inch gauge, I would just like to clarify one thing, more 24 hours of the day, the 8, 8, and 8 is, uh, not that I know of, really in our ritual. So, just a little clarification. Yeah. Good point, good point. I have to go back and, and, and read my ritual book and check. So it's just about dividing the 24 hours of the day, not particularly in 8. And then in the York Rite ritual that we use up here, it's very specific. Three parts. Three times. That's what I thought I remembered uh, from my, I'm a little bit, I've done Arizona ritual and Philadelphia ritual. So I'm, sometimes I mix those two together. I, I do believe that it's mentioned in the first degree, the three different uses of those eight hours. Is it? I, as I recall. It doesn't specifically mention eight hours, but it oh. does say to divide three into three parts. Three uh, yeah, yeah. If you know math, which I'm sure Vic does, <laughs> then you would know that it's eight, eight times, yeah. But it could be 10 in one, and you know, you could uh, measure those out in different ways, I guess. It, it says equal. Oh, it does say equal, okay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so so which you, ritual in our ritual, oh, we do get down eight. to eight. I would say that um, when I went through the first degree, um, I think that, you know, that's where, when you get to have the title of brother and Mason. And for me, it was a very special experience. I didn't know exact, I didn't, I, I kind of knew what to expect, but I didn't know that well what to expect. And so it was a, a very, and it's, it's, you know, sometimes the less prepared you are, the better, um, because it might have more impression of, upon your mind. I, there, there is that notion. Um, 
it just depends on your, your philosophy. Yeah, that's how I was when I came in, Ted. I did not learn or read anything. I wanted to be surprised, so I pur purposely kept myself in the dark. Yep. Now, the fellow craft degree, or the second degree, and think it's this guild system of injured apprentice fellow craft. Um, the narrative is a little bit more about obedience uh, to sort of your, you know, your worshipful master, the master of the lodge, uh, how you get paid or wages. And there's also some, I think, a theme of learning in there. And that's down below where I say there's a, a symbol of a staircase and learning about the several seven liberal arts and sciences. And so there's that introduction of we should study the seven liberal arts and sciences. So there's something about being a continuous learner that's into that degree. It follows a similar pattern, but the working tools and this or the symbols are more planning or trying tools. So like a trying square, for instance. Um, and Vic, maybe you can help me out here. What's the difference between a carpenter square that we might use in our shop and a trying square that a stonemason might use? Well, I, I think when we talk about a 24 inch square, which would be a carpenter square is usually 24 inches long. But a stonemason square doesn't need to be any particular length because he's just making sure it is a 90 degree angle plane to plane. Cool. So it's rather than um, a tr we're trying the, the word trying, we're trying to see if something has 90 degree angles on it. And so we're using this set square to check and make sure things are correct. Right. And they, they would use line to make lengths of things. I mean, they all basically built it certain, you know, stone sizes they could carry unless they had four or five guys that could get together to carry the stones. But I mean, basically that would have been the difference, you know. Carpenters use a 24 inch square because as a module, it's, it's one of the like early, early building modules. So it's almost like maybe a cubit in length or something close to that. Uh, da Vinci would say you're pretty close there. Okay. We're going to have you talk about your table in a second. Uh, <laughs> so, Ted, Ted, brother, may I interject? Please. Yeah. Um, one thing that wasn't noted, and this is a, a note for the prospective Masons, is that once you're initiated and entered apprentice, in order to then take the fellow craft degree, you must become proficient or memorize the, um, the elements of the first degree before you can move on to the second. Yep, and that's a great, actually a good learning pattern as well, right? So you have to prove yourself in some way to move on to the next degree, right? The next level of learning. And it makes sense from a, if you think about a learning sciences perspective, right? You might need to know fractions before you get onto geometry, right? And so, there might be need to be some stair stepping or scaffolded of, scaffolding of learning as you're moving along. And the symbols, to me at least, seem to get more complicated and a little more abstract in nature. So they're planning and trying tools. You have this trying square, you have a compass to draw circles with. So not only are you able to draw straight lines and angles, now you're able to draw curves and circles and things. You can check for leveling, there's a level there's a plum, which is checking for perpendiculars, right? These building tools that you can use. There's this staircase we learn about after, and then we actually in the fellow craft start to learn about um, the letter G, which is contained into in our symbol of the square and the compass, uh, and what that might, some of the meanings of that, what they might mean. So let me just show you some of those tools, the fellow craft here. You have the plum, the square, and the level and depending on which ritual where you live the rituals are slightly different you might be given different um, tools but in general you have also the compass involved in this in this degree but i want to mention that these ancient symbols these symbols we use in freemasonry these building tools like the square the compass we have ritualistic handshakes we have uh sacred um settings that are lodge rooms, we have all these different things. 
they're not new ideas and they're not even uh, just ideas that came from the Enlightenment or the medieval times or even the Renaissance in between. Um, they're really old ideas. So here's an Assyrian carving, right, of two kings making a, a covenant or an, an oath to each other about something and they're using the handshake, of course, as the symbol of that, of that uh, agreement. Here's the Egyptian. You have the level, the square, and the plum, plumb line from Egyptian times. Pompeii, there's another level. We uncovered that fresco. And then we go forward in time to the Byzantine Christians. They put squares on their veils of their some of their churches. Cool. And then we get to this notion that that I want Vic to talk about of the Vitruvian man, the Truvian man. And we're all familiar with the one on the left that Vic has on his table there, but there's one on the right hand side. Does anybody know the one on the right hand side? So that one's from a, a guy where they think that Da Vinci got his from. <laughs> Right, and this guy was just almost contemporary to Da Vinci. And what I think is interesting about his rendition is there you have a plumb line on the head. You have a, a compass and a square, of course, which is made, used to make the circle and the square. And maybe Vic, you can tell us a little bit about what is this Ventruvian man that Da Vinci wrote and what is it trying to, what's the, what's the problem it's trying to solve and what is it trying to set out? Not fair. <laughs> uh, uh, our Blue Lodge will meet in June, and uh, I am giving the education that night on the architecture of man, and that's why I'm using the Vitruvian man uh, on my table to advertise. I wasn't trying to trump you. Oh, awesome. But uh, that presentation has, uh, including translation of all the verbiage and some of the proportions. It's really about proportion. Yeah, about these ideas of proportion. And I didn't know much about this, and I will be very excited to go to Vic's presentation because I think that these ideas of proportion is one of the keys to unlocking some of the secrets of Freemasonry, if you will. So we tell all these stories and we have all these rituals, but sometimes we're like, well, what does it mean? And I think that some of these, uh, what I would call sacred proportions might be a key to some of the ideas that we have in Freemasonry. So you have Da Vinci trying to solve this, this problem that Vitruvius, an ancient Roman architect wrote De Ar Architectura on architecture uh, in the ancient Roman times. And he says that uh, the perfect proportions of man, he should be able to fit in a square. So top to bottom and wingspan but also that the arms and legs should be able to form this circle. But a lot of people try to solve this in different ways. Like you see on the right hand side that the square is inside of the circle because people were using the belly button as the center, yeah. right? But the square center is the groin, right? This is how, this is how Da Vinci solves this problem. And what you see is that why would this guy, this Roman guy be, who's writing a book about architecture be trying to look at the proportions of man? Well, the notion was that man is God's greatest creation. And so everything that we build to be a reflection of those proportions that God has put to man, right? And there seems to be um, harmonic propor proportions in man that we inherently like because it looks like us. So if you build a building that has the same proportions as a human, we tend to like that, not because we're selfish, but because it is an expression of sort of the proportions that we're used to, right? What we're used to. Now, not everybody's wingspan is perfectly the same as their height, but it's pretty close, right? Most people is pretty close. And so here you see on the right-hand side, this notion that if you want to create the proportions um, of man, you need a square and a compass and a perpendicular. And similarly, they become like these uh, emblems of creation, if you will. So maybe God used uh, similar, you know, symbolically, not literally, 
the square and the compass to create the earth. And here you have William Blake's famous painting, um, The Ancient of Days. And it's in reference to Proverbs 8.27. This is the King James Version. When God prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Right? This notion that the square and the compass, these two basic shapes um, from which all things can be created, right? And that you would need a certain set of tools, basic tools to be able to come up with very um, extravagant creations. Okay, um, any other comments or questions before we go on to the third degree? Sure, if you don't mind. Please. Uh, I think um, my experience with uh, Freemasonry, so I was uh, raised in uh, October of last year. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I kind of kept going back to was, what's it all about? You know, I mean, it is, it, it is explained in the degrees, but there's always this sense that there's something profound that just occurred and you can just think about it over and over again and try to suss out the meaning. And I think what's fascinating about the symbols of each one of the degrees is that it just goes on forever. It's a fractal. Yeah. You, can, you can keep drawing more and more information out of each one of the, de the degrees. And um, one of my inferences is after a lot of consideration, the first, second, and third degree could also be seen as a map of uh, the three parts of a human being, the body, the mind, and the spirit in yep. that order. And I, I just think it's, it's a fascinating thing how much you can pull from each, from each individual degree. And by the way, um, you know, there are some studies I was looking at that show that these proportions roughly is what you find in ancient temples, right? That's, that was the point of Vitruvius when he was talking about uh, writing his on architecture and then saying, look, this is the fundamental proportions we should use, use for what? For building temples, he says, right? For building these sacred spaces where we might encounter the divine, if you will. And that um, maybe symbolically we should be looking at the lodge or the temple uh, as a pattern for us. Now, some people get really like into sort of like the anatomy of the human body and how all this is correlated. And I, I kind of, I can see that. However, I think there is more of a symbolic nature here of, look, um, are we building ourselves into this temple that we hope for? Is there a way to apply these tools in a symbolic way that is changing us as we're moving by degree by degree, a little by little, right? Do we do we know that the, if you go back to the the two pictures of the fellows, do we know that the guy on the right or did the one on the right was a mason? Because I see four symbols there at least. Mm -hmm. you know, the the square, the compass, and then uh, beneath his feet uh, is a another symbol that's within the lodge. Yeah, we don't think he is. Let me tell you his name. It's Takola from 1640. Uh, and of course, the Renaissance was obsessed with neoclassicism and Kabbalah, also Jewish mysticism. And so you see this, you see this kind of um, people trying to solve these ancient architecture problems and then to put them in, into everyday use. Let me see if I can get back to my... And Da Vinci, was he a Mason? Not that we know of. Because I, I see a hint of it there as well. Yeah. I think what we see is that, um, play from current slide, that a lot of these Renaissance ideas and these Enlightenment ideas are, are inculcated or embedded inside the system of Freemasonry. And that Renaissance and Enlightenment ideas are actually just a recapitulation or summary of ancient ideas, right, with new spins on them updated for people to understand now. And so sometimes when we're going through this degree work, we're going, well, this is, seems like a really, like, why are we doing it this way? Well, it was the modern form of ancient mystery school that was repackaged in Renaissance and Enlightenment garb, right? And, and packaging over again. So it's these old ideas um, put into a system. But yeah, like the, the, the one on the right is, it was striking. I was actually watching a Hit, uh, not a history channel, um, American, 
I think actually it was Smithsonian Channel, Smithsonian Channel, and it was something about Da Vinci. And they were like kind of debunking that Da Vinci wasn't quite the genius that we thought. He was a genius, but he was really summarizing the work of lots of others, even in his flying machines and things like that. He was really summarizing the work of his time. Um, but he just is a much better artist than everyone else. <laughs> and, so, and so he was a genius as far as the artist, artistry is concerned in mathematics. Um, but these ideas existed, right? They were around before him, or at least contemporaneously. So here we have the third degree, the master Mason degree. And to be honest, when I went through first degree and second degree, the third degree is very different from the uh, first and second degrees, in my opinion. And part of that is, is because there's much more of a story about Hiram Abiff, this chief architect of the Temple of Solomon, um, and him uh, dying and being reborn, if you will, symbolically and physically in this story. And so there's a lot of symbolism to draw out of that. Um, the working tools are all the working tools of the other two degrees and this idea of a trowel, right? This idea that uh, stonemasons could spread cement to join things together and we're taught to, to use that to sort of spread the cement of brotherly love and cement society together and those kinds of things in a symbolic nature. But the Master Masons degree has this really um, strong theme of uh, death and rebirth and in my opinion, reaching a new level of consciousness, right? This idea of going from uh, not just being someone who is uh, doing what other people say, but now you're a master mason and you can lay out designs, right? For buildings and you can uh, lay foundations to buildings and you can join things together that will stand the test of time. So this idea of um, change within the, the individual brother or the person moving through this ritual degree. And also this notion that um, now you have to pay it forward to help those that are in coming behind you to be helping them to learn about sort of what do these degrees mean or what are different uh, aspects of it. And I think that um, the brother who just talked earlier that, you know, there's so many interpretations you can have of these symbols and that's what makes it so great, right? Is that you, People from a lot of different walks of life and different worldviews can find and attach different meanings to that. Now, I'm not one to say that you can attach any meaning to a symbol because then it becomes meaningless. Um, but what I would say is that, that within, there's a very wide universe of different, um, different meanings that you can attach to different, the different symbols of Freemasonry. We, of course, are pretty overt that we're talking about them as uh, building tools, but building tools applied symbolically to ourselves to build a better person. But there's deeper meanings inside of those. I think one of them that I just mentioned earlier is this notion that the square and the compass are creative tools or symbols of creative forces, right? Uh, they're also symbols of maybe male and female, right? There's all kinds of different things you can start pulling out of that um, to make meaning for yourself and to affect meaning in, in uh, each other. There's also, this is from one of the ritual monitors that my wife bought me actually from 1857. And you can see that uh, it has a little picture about the death and burial of Hiram Abiff. And then we also have this symbol of um, the broken column, Father Time that is symbolizing the death of Hiram Abiff and the weeping, the weeping uh, statue and, and Time standing behind undoing the ringlets or the locks of hair. And so there's a lot of symbols that can be attached to that as well. Now, all this is to say that um, I think that what sets Freemasonry apart from many other clubs, societies, fraternities that you can join is that it is a system that has ritual embedded into it that is meant to teach us lessons and to change us as human beings. And I think that it's a time-tested system of moral education, right? That we can learn through symbols, we can, and it, you can constantly reattach new meanings and that you can move through this idea of a morality play on your own. I'm gonna end with uh, one more thing that we talked about last time. 
And that is in the behavioral sciences and in psychology, there's this idea of a transportation narrative theory. And the idea is that, you know, when we watch a movie and there's a guy named Paul Zak from Claremont Graduate University who wrote an article called Why Movies Make Us Cry. And he tells the story about sitting on a plane watching Million Dollar Baby, this movie, and he's very sad and he's crying at his seat. And he doesn't even know he's crying until the person next to him taps him on the shoulder and says, sir, are you okay? And he realizes that he's been sobbing to this movie in the middle of a Boeing 747, you know, and he's lost himself. And the reason is that in psychology, this idea of transportation narrative is that when we're watching a movie, when we're reading a good book, when we're seeing a really good play or we're participating in a really good Masonic ritual, for instance, we, we psychologically step into the protagonist's role and we feel and experience the same emotions that that protagonist in the story is feeling, right? So that's why movies make us cry. That's why the Greeks gathered people together for these public plays uh, um, and had this idea of catharsis, right? Of getting, having a, a communal experience of getting all of your emotions out. Why the Romans perhaps one reason why they had this idea of gladi gla gladiators fighting in these arenas is if you have public violence, like I like to watch um, UFC sometimes, then maybe the public is less violent in and of itself because they are symbolically or vicariously participating in violence through, through a public display. Or why do we go to, um, why do we even go to uh, comedy shows? If you think about what a comedian does is he really just, says really mean things about people, right? But it's a way for us to, to participate in that meanness, that shadow self that we have from a union perspective, if you will, and participate in society uh, in an acceptable way, uh, sort of participating either in, you know, crying, letting out emotions, uh, seeing violent films, for instance. There's all kinds of vicarious experiences and what I'm arguing here is that the Masonic ritual is one of these vicarious symbolic experiences that we become the candidate, the protagonist, the person moving through this story arc of youth, middle age, old age, not knowing much, knowing more, knowing uh, being a master, uh, having simple planning tools to more complex planning tools apply to our morality, uh, starting from uh, very uh, simple O's that we take to more complex O's and promises we make, moving from darkness to light, moving from uh, death or actually towards death and through death and, and then out of death, right, and being reborn. And so I think that that's the, one of the big things that sets apart Freemasonry and what's appealing to me, at least one of the aspects, is this notion that it's not just I'm going to tell you, it's not self-help books I'm not going to tell you how to get better. I'm going to put you through a ritual that you can reflect on over and over again and that can teach you profound lessons that are tied or encapsulations of ancient wisdom traditions. And for me, that becomes extremely powerful. And it's this idea of the symbol of the entire idea of moving from a rough stone to a smooth stone, or as we say, a rough ashlar to a smooth ashlar. Are we starting off as this rough person? Are we knocking the edges off? Are we trying ourselves with the square? Are we keeping ourselves uh, in due bounds, for instance, to then become a smooth block that fits into society, if you will, the building of society, our own personal temple that we're building of ourselves and others. There's just so much, so many layers of symbology there. And for me, that's what makes us different. And that's what draws me to this is that Freemasonry is, in my opinion, the summation, recapitulation, and systemized um, um, notion of ancient mystery traditions that work to enact change. So that's what I got for you tonight, but I'm glad to talk more. Let's leave that up. Brother Ted, I want to jump in. Please. Uh, one of the things that you didn't throw in was the fact that it's a journey, but you're not going alone, by the way. Good point. Uh, 
Freemasonry, and it's one of the things that we do, I think, that's most important is mentoring. And I'm just going to ask you, you went up through Philadelphia. What was the name of your mentor in Philadelphia? Yeah, so I had the Worshipful Master who was helping me. Um, his name was Ryan Rex. So I would just like to point out that you ask any Freemason who's delighted with the fraternity, he'll know if it's mentor. Yep. And hard as well, probably as well. But now you're our mentor. So I just wanted to point out that you know we have guides. I'm senior deacon right now, and that's one of the interesting parts of the of the um, the role is you're the messenger kind of guide in the lodge. I'm just really enjoying that. And and next year, uh, as we say, God willing, I'll be sitting in the south as the architect. Yeah. I'm delighted. I'm delighted for you to be seen again. No, oh, thank you. Thank you guys for having me. This is always fun. I learn a lot preparing. Our friends who are non-Masons, do you guys have anything you want to ask or chime in here? You can all unmute yourselves. I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, so, Ted, you said that this is um, a basically a, a system for learning to uh, transform yourself. What What's the biggest transformation you've seen um, from applying Freemasonry to yourself? I think that the biggest thing, the biggest change I've seen in myself is um, willingness to be open to new ideas and different, and different points of view. So I think that when I started out in Freemasonry, I very much had a very particular worldview that I tried to force fit everything in my life uh, to and anything that didn't fit within that worldview, I would reject. And what I think Freemasonry has done is uh, exposed me not only to ideas, but also to Vic's point, other men that have different value sets than I might have, different worldviews. And for me to stop with respect and consider those viewpoints and even adopt some of those. So I've been a, a Master Mason for 12 years now. I have not taken the higher degrees yet because I hadn't felt ready. I now feel like I'm finally ready to go into the higher degrees. And so I'll be doing that in the next year or so. But I don't think I was ready to move to those next degrees of Freemasonry because I wasn't open-minded enough yet to receive the, the concepts that might be encountered in those higher degrees. I wasn't open-minded enough. So I think for me, that's the biggest change I've seen is, is being willing to be open-minded. And my wife says, you know, she likes to send me to lodge because I come back with a smile on my face and some new ideas to think about, whether that's debating something with Jamie Lamb or, or talking with Vic to learn about, you know, architecture. I mean, I can't tell you how much I've learned from Bo and Vic and Andrew and all the brothers in Arizona number two, and also in Ascension Lodge and the research lodge and learning all the, that stuff as being exposed to different ideas. And that's really changed my viewpoints. Thanks. Hi, this is Walt. Um, I'm interested to know if there's a concept of spending a certain amount of time at each degree in the journey. Good question, and I'll make sure I get this right with Brother Worshipful Brother Bo. Different jurisdictions are different. Uh, I believe in Arizona, you have to be in each degree for six months. Is that correct? No, no, there's no requirement to be in a particular degree for a particular amount of time. Six months, you have to know a couple of Masons to sign your petition. You have to have known them for six months to petition the lodge to join. That's it. Go ahead. You, you must also, I, if I'm not mistaken, Andrew might be able to answer this more precisely. Once you take the entered apprentice degree, you have two years to take the fellow or to become proficient, take fellow craft, two years to do the fellow craft proficiency. Uh, in order to become a master mason. Is that correct, Andrew? Correct. So there is expiration. You, you, you have that time. You can do it in three months or a month if you can, but you, you've got to do it within those time frames. And Pascal just put in the chat that it's six months in North Carolina. There's different, different jurisdictions might have waiting periods, others don't. Is it true, um, is there some lodges that require in Arizona a little bit of a waiting period between degrees or no? Ascension, I don't know what Ascension's uh, uh, 
participation rule is, but Jason Brock can tell you like, uh, Jason had an idea of how he wanted to do his degrees and wanted to space them out in a certain way. There's no requirement that you have to do them in three months, but in Arizona, typically you're seeing brothers go from three to six months, but that's only because that's just kind of the pace of the lodges. Maybe that's up to the lodge. It's up to the master and it's up to the brother to kind of determine how fast they want to move through those. To go south of the border to Mexico, you are an entered apprentice for two years. You are a fellow craft for two years. <laughs> no short that's, that's, that's a good point, uh, Andrew. Like my, I have a, a good friend from Brazil and he found out I was a Mason and he was impressed I was a master Mason because he's, he's still a fellow craft and he's been at it for four years, I believe. So, you know, uh, in Brazil, it's similar. Thank you. Hey, uh, in South of the border, as you well said, we have different periods of waiting time. But for example, I'm right now on my fellow craft, and everybody's saying that, well, you should have completed it in about six months to a year. Uh, I mean, it's different because we have uh, other uh, brothers that are still in the fellow craft degree and been there for the past uh, five years. So right. It, right. it takes the pace of any brother. In yeah. California, there's basically no time limit. You could be a entered apprentice for five, six years. I mentioned in North Carolina, it was six months. If the brother in question is, has not returned his catechism and, and stood his proficiency in six months, he can apply for an application for advancement. And the lodge has to vote on that to uh, let him continue. Yeah. I went through it six weeks when I was 21. I was pretty sharp back then. Did I have a clue what I was doing? Absolutely not. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, I had a young coach that I went to high school with, and he didn't know any more than I did, honestly. Uh, so I've had to, I had to do a lot of studying because it was mentioned earlier that I think one of the new brothers said, there's got to be more than this. The brother that was just raised last November, I think. And it took a long time to find somebody to start explaining this stuff to me. What in the world am I doing? Why? <laughs> yeah. And and, yeah. and they are really they have really pushed Masonic education hard in North Carolina. And we have what's called the Speakers Bureau. So at every Harmon meeting, I've usually got somebody from the Speakers Bureau, Bottom or Past Grandmasters. They come and talk. They'll talk on history. They'll talk on the deeper meaning, going down the rabbit hole, I like to call it. And they talk yeah. about a lot of things. The Grand Master spoke last year, and I said, he said, what do you want me to talk about? I said, you're the Grand Master. Just talk to us. And he did, and it was wow. Yeah. He just he just talked to us as men and masons for about 30 minutes, and my wife and his wife were downstairs, and she said, I don't know what y'all were doing up there, but we could feel the good vibes coming through the floor. That was an epic night for me. That's amazing. I yeah, the brother, Pascal, the brother you were talking about was Brother Rob Knotts, and I wanted to comment on what he said to those non-Masons here is this thing that we're doing here tonight about learning about what these degrees are, what Brother Rob Knotts said was this learning process never ends. It just keeps yeah. going and going and going. And kind of the cool thing about Masonry is as you learn and grow as an individual, these things shift and change and take on new meanings and you learn something different about yourself and your journey. And that's, that's the cool part about Freemasonry. And that's because we're constantly changing. I'm a totally different person at 63 than I was at 21. Yeah. The system is, is such that we can keep digging and learning different angles, right? You can look at, uh, the symbols from different angles. Yes, there's a pendant bodies you can join as well. But even if you're just thinking about Blue Lodge, first three degrees, there's a lot of stuff packed in there, a lot of interpretations you can find. I'm just learning about Kabbalah right now. Um, <laughs> I was corresponding with a professor at Lehigh University in outside of Philadelphia, who is a professor of uh, medieval Jewish studies in Kabbalah. And I'm asking him questions and I'm, you know, my mind's starting to open a little bit more to how that stuff is found in Freemasonry. 
Brother Ted, I want to I just stop for a minute and thank you for presenting. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end us with a prayer, and then we can keep talking, but I want to stop our recording at a, at a logical spot. Thank you very much for uh, giving this education, and uh, I, I am recording it, something we can share with everybody. And uh, Brother John Canisales, can I ask you to uh, close us out with a prayer? Yes, Marshall. Great architect of the universe, keep us ever conscious during all our doings through life. We remember with grateful awareness that Freemasonry is a way of life. May this Masonic education given tonight benefit our fraternity and its wholesome impact upon the world. Go with us and guide us as we depart. In thy name's sake, we pray. Amen. So mote it be.